Well, Chief Inspector, this discussion of birch bark tea has made me thirsty. Me too. Peach lemonade? Mmm. Mmm. Very refreshing. Very good. All right, so we're back for the Bavarian Airship Regatta for Corona Story Time, <clears throat> and we are up to Air Winch Cannons. Okay, I take it you like this chapter. Since she was still a bit wobbly, Sparky spent the rest of Saturday on the Birkin Hair checking and rechecking its state of preparedness. She was grateful for the lack of public duties and not just because she was a tad unsteady. Unfortunately, Sunday was quite different. McTrow and Luis Miguel Sevilla scoured the airship for any additional extraneous ballast that could be offloaded in Munich and collected at the end of the regatta. She knew they would need to lighten the load as much as possible if they were to have a fighting chance against the sleeker Iron Eagle. She mentally cursed Wallace for taking on paying passengers. That man's greed vastly exceeded his sense. And then she had a truly uncharitable thought about Wallace's personal girth and momentarily entertained a wish that surely violated her Hippocratic oath. <laughs> Distracted as she was by her daydreaming, she was nearly knocked off her feet by Herr Fenstermacher, the referee, who was climbing up out of the mechanical compartment under the bridge. Guten Tag, Herr Fenstermacher. Guten Tag, Dr. McTroll. You feeling better, yeah? You are not so good with the Deutsches beer, no? His obsequious smile dared her to cross him. No, I suppose French wine is more agreeable to me. She smiled back smugly. Two could play at that game. I have finished my inspection. You will meet at the judge's station in one hour. He marched off the bridge without another word, nearly colliding with Ivan Krasnaya Rubashka, who was entering. Is very unpleasant men. Indeed, Mr. Krasnaya Rubashka. I want to thank you for managing preparations so expertly while I was indisposed. I'm going to head down for a spot of breakfast before the meeting with the judge and referees. Let us hope the ballast allocation for the Iron Eagle is fair. She looked across to the tower where El Toro Rojo had anchored while she was unconscious. Its yellow envelope with a rampaging red bull was certainly eye-catching, even headache-inducing, one might say. But that wasn't the most unusual thing about it. There was a metal scaffolding ring that ran from the top of the gondola around the entire circumference of the center of the envelope. There was a large bronze cylinder mounted on the top of the scaffolding pointing fore and aft, and a matching one about two-thirds of the way down to the gondola. Presumably there was a third one mounted on the port side that was out of view. She wondered what it could possibly be. It must have some very valuable function to warrant the considerable extra weight. When she reached the gangplank, Drake was standing at the railing, scanning the skies apprehensively. Good morning, Dr. McTroll. Good morning to you, Chief Inspector. Without even asking or indicating what he was doing, he preceded her across the gangplank and down the tower. As he made the turn at the first landing, a shadow flickered overhead. She looked up just in time to catch a glimpse of a black shape moving quickly off the gangplank. She could hear footsteps above her all the way down the tower, but couldn't see their source. She had her second near miss of the morning at the bottom of the tower when Drake stopped crisply and surveyed the surrounding area before stepping aside to allow her to exit the tower. He was nattering inanely about the weather. How very unlike him! She stole a look over her shoulder and the mysterious shadowy specter was revealed to be Sergeant Fox in his black combat fatigues. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> She and Drake were strolling at a relatively leisurely pace, but Fox wasn't closing the distance. She glanced back twice more between the base of the tower and the tea house next to the parade ground. Fox was always five seconds behind them. Drake repeated his maneuver from the bottom of the stairs when they entered the tea house, but this time Sparky was prepared. She started counting to herself. One, two, three, four, five, but no Fox. She turned back to Drake. You and Sergeant Fox are not very stealthy. One is not subtle when one wishes to deliver a message of deliberation. She took a slow breath. I see. She spotted Willy Donf across the room and waved at him. He looked quite pleased to see her and immediately headed toward her and Drake. He was obviously unaccompanied. <laughs> The other pilots don't appear to be under surveillance. Protection. 
Surveillance is for suspects. Their protection is not my concern. It was at that moment that McTrowell realized that he was a different person when he was on duty, and she was very glad to be under his protection and not his surveillance. Guten Tag, Dr. McTrowell. How wonderful that you are recovered. He looked as though he wanted to embrace her, but thought better of it at the last minute and shook her hand vigorously. Guten Tag, Herr Inspector Drake. Sparky wouldn't have thought it physically possible, but he shook Drake's hand even more vigorously. Thank you, I'm relieved to be recovered and ready for the race. Dolph didn't strike her as the kind of man to be intimidated by a little posturing by a competitor, but it didn't hurt to let him know that she wasn't going to be deterred by a little misfortune and a bump on the head. Drake entertained her throughout their brief breakfast with a history of sword sticks, which was pleasantly diverting. She didn't need to look back to detect the shield of Sergeant Fox reattaching himself as she and Drake exited the tea house. Drake dropped back when she got up to the judge's table. He took up a position equidistant from the table, but opposite Fox. They walked in a circle around the table and the pilots. If they were attempting to appear nonchalant, they were failing miserably. But perhaps this was more deliberation. While all the pilots were present, neither the judge nor the referees were anywhere in sight. She flipped open her pocket watch. It had been an hour and five minutes since she and Herr Fenstermacher had parted company. All the officials were late. Mm. How very un-German. She and the other pilots discussed the weather conditions and the topography of the course. She checked her watch again. The officials were half an hour late. What was keeping them? Drake and Fox had come together on their perimeter and were talking quietly, but purposefully, when they resumed their patrol. The perimeter was smaller. Drake had his sword stick out and his thumb on the release. Fox's hand was on his pistol. The conversation between the pilots dwindled down to nothing and they all began looking around nervously. It was nearly an hour past the designated meeting time when Herr Zimmerman hastened up to the table, trailed by a phalanx of referees. He was quite red in the face and obviously perturbed. He launched immediately into a diatribe in rapid-fire German. McTrowell, Pierre Dugard, and Bjorn Swenson exchanged bewildered looks. Although Felipe Garza didn't seem to understand what was being said, he looked quite anxious. Of course, Donf understood every word, each of which contributed incrementally to the expression of astonishment and indignation on his face. Before Zimmerman could launch into his customary translation into multiple languages, Donf turned to McTrowell and exclaimed, the judges have approved the Red Bull's use of Erwin's cannons. Felipe Garza lost his composure and triumphantly shouted, Ole! <laughs> Erwin's cannons? Well, I guess we'll have to wait until the next chapter of the Bavarian Airship Regatta on Corona Story Time to find out what the heck Erwin's cannons are. Okay, well, we'll see you next time. 